Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever and whenever you are. My name is Benjamin, and in this video, I'm going to be showing some of the new features of GameMaker Studio 2. Okay, let's get started. The first thing I'm going to do is open up GameMaker Studio 2 right here. And you can see we have a new welcome menu. We have recent projects. Real quick, I want to show you, if you go to new project, you can see that we can now select between a drag and drop project or a GameMaker language project. I'm going to actually use one of the built-in projects. Okay, one of the first things that you'll notice is now we have what is called a workspace. You can create new workspaces by clicking on this tab up here, and you can have multiple workspaces. You can drag a new workspace out, and it will create a new window, which then you can drag over onto a second screen if you wish. To create a new resource in this workspace, you can right-click, go to Resources. I'm going to create a new sound, and you can see I can grab this resource and move it around. If I want to navigate my workspace, I can hold space and then left click to navigate the workspace. Or I can also middle click. If I open up multiple objects inside of my workspace, you can see I can then navigate my workspace to see all of these different objects. I can zoom in the workspace. And if I want to navigate to one of these objects, when you're zoomed out far enough, you can no longer click the buttons on the object. So you can, if you double click on it, it will actually focus on that object. So you can zoom out and then double click to focus in on a specific object that you would like to work on. Another trick is to press control tab. This will give you a list of your workspaces and a list of your active windows. You can see I've got the three objects open. If I double click on one of these, it will bring that object to my view. You can also press Control T to search for any object inside of your room. So if I want to search for the enemy, I can search object baddie, press enter, and it will bring it up. If it's not already open inside of my workspace, it will open it up. If I want to edit this object and I double click on the create event, you can see that it will chain these different windows together so that I know they're all related. This is called the chain view and it helps you to keep better track of the windows inside of your workspace and where they belong to. If you move the parent of the chain it will remove the entire chain but you can move the children individually in this way. Really quick, let's look at the new game options. I can come down here in the resources and go to main. The main differences that I notice here, you can set your game's frames per second right here. Instead of inside of the room, you can set your default draw color, and it also keeps track of how long this project has been open and when it was initially created. Let's talk about the code editor. Inside of the code editor, we now have autocomplete for all variables. You can see I'm creating a variable XP, where this is the example project. So they're creating a variable XP right here. If I go into the step event and start typing XP, you can see I have autocompletion for that variable and it lists it as a variable. Now this autocompletion seems to be global for instance and global variables. For local variables, it isn't global. So if I create a variable here, test equals zero, and I move down and I start typing test, I will get autocomplete for this. Local variable test, right there, you can see. However, since this variable is only accessible inside of this script, if I go into the step event right here, and you can see when you have two code actions open, you get tabs now. If I go into the create event here, I do not have auto completion for the variable test because it's only available inside of this code action. Our auto completion window is color coded in the same way that the code editor is color coded. So constants uh, or built in variables will be green, constants will be red, like this, and functions will be orange in the same way that they are inside of the editor. If you like, you can right click inside of here and convert between drag and drop and uh, GameMaker language. Macros can now be defined in line, like this. The ternary operator is now available. This line of code right here will set test equal to true if x is greater than 0 and false if it's not. 
In order to get auto completion on scripts, we now will use javadoc notation, and that looks like this. And you can see I now have the helper for what parameters need to be passed in. In the sprite editor, you can now preview your animation. You can also toggle looping and ping ponging if you want it to ping pong back and forth. Inside of the image editor, you can draw while an animation is playing. You can now view all of your images inside of the editor. And we now have different image layers down here. The sprite editor has been improved. There's some things that are not the same slash missing, but for the most part, it's looking really good. For sounds, you can now adjust your volume here. If you click here, you can adjust the volume of multiple tracks at the same time inside of a sound group. The timeline editor hasn't changed much. You add moments, then you have code for those moments. A moment can now have a description. Tile sets now need a sprite. Create a new tile set and select a sprite. This allows you to create one giant sprite for all of the tiles that you need. The very top left tile needs to be blank. Inside of the tile set editor, you have a brush builder, which allows you to create custom brushes using multiple tiles. You will then be able to use these brushes to paint tiles in your room. There's a tile set animation. We can click add an animation. These animations have to have a frame count that is a power of two. Once you've created an animation, you can save that animation in your library of animations right here. You can have multiple and then you can place them inside of your room. Tile sets can also have auto tiling. There are two types, 16 and 48. I'm going to show you 48. These images right here need to match up with the tiles that you select. Once you've matched up each of your tiles with the tiles on here, your auto tile is ready to go. And I'll show you how to use that inside the room editor. The room editor is the bigger one here. It's the thing that has probably changed the most aside from tiles. Rooms now use layers. There are five kinds of layers, background layers, instance layers, tile layers, path layers, and asset layers. Asset layers, from what I can tell, can, can contain any asset, but the thing that is unique to them is you can drag a sprite over onto the asset layer. So you can have a sprite inside of your room without ever assigning it to an object. Background layers can be animated. Let's start by adding some instances to this instance layer. You can click and drag an instance into the room. Once it's in the room, you can rotate it or scale it. And these seem to be working better than they did. You can also create multiple instances by holding Alt and drawing them. If you hold Shift, you can then select multiple instances and delete them or move them. You can also hold Control to pick multiple instances inside of a specific area. It looks like it's selecting lots of them, but you can see right here that I've only selected one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's move on to tile layers. I'm going to create a new tile layer. Should be noted that layers that are higher up right here are displayed first. If I drag my background layer in front of my instance layer, the instances will no longer be visible because the black background layer is covering them up. Once we have our tile layer, we need to select a tile set. I'm going to select this tile set right here. Once we have the tile set, we can select the base tiles that are in the set. We can go to brushes and create from the brushes. You can see here are some brushes that were created. I can create this entire brush right here inside of the room. I'm going to drag the tiles under the instances. If you go to libraries, we have animation library and walls. Let's do walls first. And this is for auto tiling. 
And look how nice that is. I'm really excited for this feature. We can also place our animated tiles. I'm going to place water inside of here. Inside the room editor, you can preview animations by hitting play. Now for one of the biggest changes that I think will influence the way games are made in Game Maker the most. Rooms can inherit from other rooms. I'm going to right click on room 1 and do create child. Now this room is a child of room 1 and inherits all of its properties. Now that I have the child room, if I go into the parent room, go into the background, change the background color to white, reopen the child room, you will see that the background color is now white. What the child room inherits from the parent room can be selected. You can see right here if I click on the backgrounds layer and unselect inherit, it will still stay white. However, if I go back into the parent room and change the background to black again and go into the child room, the child room is still white because it is no longer inheriting. But if I press inherit again, it will start inheriting and it will change back to black. So that's really cool. I think that room inheritance is one of the most powerful new features that Game Maker Studio 2 has. Thank you so much for watching this video. Hopefully it was helpful to you. If it was, give it a thumbs up and share it. And I will talk to you guys later.